And welcome back to our afternoon session on best practices, challenges, and solutions for virtual conferencing. In this session, we will hear from scientific societies, government, and nonprofit organizations who will share their experiences and lessons learned in virtual conference organization and implementation. We will begin with presentations from four of our speakers, followed by a group discussion and Q&A. Then we will take a 25-minute break and conclude this session, conclude this session with the final four speakers, again followed by a group Q&A. You can submit your questions for our speakers at any time into the Q&A chat box and vote on questions that have been submitted. Now we welcome our first speaker, Ms. Lori Wingate, Chief Operating Officer at the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Hello, I'm excited about the opportunity to present at this conference and to share some of our learning with you. I'd like to start uh, by giving some context around the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, which we often refer to as NASM. We are mission-driven. We're a nonprofit organization that provides expert advice on some of the most important and exciting challenges facing the nation and our world. All topics from agriculture to earth sciences, engineering, all the way to transportation and infrastructure. They're all uh, disciplines and divisions uh, that, that we support here at the academies. The National Academy of Sciences was created by a congressional charter signed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1863 as science really began to play a, a, uh, an ever increasing role in national priorities and public life. And the NAS was eventually expanded to include the National Research Council, which is the operating arm of the academies, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Medicine. So the NAS, the NAE, and the NAM are honorary uh, member organizations, and these are members who are elected in recognition of their distinguished and continuing achievements in research and practice. Membership is widely accepted mark of excellence in their field and is considered one of the highest honors that a scientist, engineer, health professional, or researcher can receive. And many of our members have been awarded Nobel Prizes or other prestigious prizes from their disciplines. So in order to perform our mission, which we're going to talk about uh, in COVID and after, after the pandemic, in order to perform this mission, the academies bring together leaders uh, who are top experts in their field from academia, industry, government, and other sectors, as well as members of the academies to provide unbiased, evidence-based advice to the government and to the citizens of the United States. So I'd like to, now that I've set the tone on what our organization does, I'd like to talk a little bit about what, how, how they go about doing their work, which is uh, very, um, very important when we talk about how that work has changed during uh, the pandemic and, and on. So the types of activities that the academies uh, perform are, well, in their traditional workspace, it spans a, a multitude of convening activities. These bring attendees from the thousands to the tens of thousands and, and, and annually may include workshops, conferences, and other gathering of members, volunteers, and staff. Uh, volunteers can contribute to the work of the National Academies in many different ways, including serving on one of our consensus study committees, serving as a member of a board or standing committee, participating in workshops or symposia, or participating in our rigorous uh, peer review process. In addition to this, we also publish. So the National Academies publishes um, the National Academies Press, over 200 reports and proceedings each year on a wide range of topics. And the National Academies also publish the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, PNAS Nexus, and several other journals and periodicals. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how COVID changed our world. Now, up until March of 2020, all of the activities that I have described in the previous slides uh, were performed on site. In fact, it was our hallmark, uh, so to speak, and part of our success paradigm to hold in-person, face-to-face convening and collaboration sessions. As with 
everyone else during COVID, um, all National Academy activities were moved to online venues, meetings, conferences, workshops, uh, as well as daily operations, finance, human resources, information technology, all of these moved online while the facility staff kept watch on the buildings and they watched them empty and then they sat that way for two and a half years. And so um, printing of material stopped and travel stopped and the culture really pivoted and, and basically moved forward without hesitation. The organization con continued to experience solid performance and completing contracts for the plans and adding new sponsored work without, uh, with their, well, without any um, deviation. As a matter of fact, saw more projects coming in than in the past. Some of the um, key initiatives that emerged from our um, our implementation of how we do work during the COVID time. Uh, these evolved most specifically since June of 2021. In that time frame, in June of 2021, we started to move into what we considered a hybrid mode. We invited staff back into the office at whatever pace they really deemed appropriate and incorporated a combination of technologies and methods for both internal and external participants throughout throughout our facilities and in particular throughout our conference rooms. Keeping safety at the forefront of our minds and of our actions, we implemented things like social distancing, masking when risks were high. We required vaccinations in order to come into the facilities and um, we limited conference room occupancy to minimize the risk. We also developed a path forward to evolve our facility spaces based on an understanding that our staff really wanted to retain the flexibility of remote working at least some of the time, and we also needed to address growth. So that path forward included a few things. We started with a move back to on-site events and activities, but always providing a hybrid option. And in some cases, continuing to fully remote. We added functionality like videos, polls, voting, um, other types of collaborative, you know, um, collaborative activities like moving um, individuals from room to room virtually. And had a lot of lessons learned around that hybrid option, which was very challenging as, uh, as far as making sure that all of the individuals, whether they were in the room or off-site, were able to participate and be heavily involved. Much of that we did um, by having everyone log in to the virtual event, even if they were sitting in the room. So in addition to that, we also um, created some new physical collaboration spaces. Uh, we wanted to give the staff the opportunity to try new things and to encourage them to come in to the facilities while maybe working in a different way, coming in to collaborate, coming in to meet up and have impromptu conversations. So the move to, ho we also took uh, another step of moving to hoteling spaces throughout our facilities. We wanted to um, provide those, provide a space for staff that were only coming in irregularly or didn't need to be in full time and uh, didn't have a need for a full designated space. We wanted to have the opportunity to convert space to other um, more collaborative uh, locations. So we also adopted new technology and methods to facilitate communications and, in, and interactions. The National Academies considers itself uh, in an experimental phase of flexible hybrid work. We are considering how we want to work and what will work best with our members, our volunteers, and our staff. We are still what I would consider slow walking up to in the office time, allowing staff and their supervisors to make decisions about what is best for them and for the organization. We've polled, surveyed, had open sessions and town halls, provided public email folders, and opened other mechanisms to solicit feedback 
which we could then evolve from. And we continue to make changes to our policies, processes, and technological environment with new capabilities that address evolving needs. Understand this, we are trying to understand the state of travel and meetings in this new environment, and this is challenging. In some instances, um, our, our staff and members strive to attend in-person meetings again, and hybrid meetings need to accommodate members who cannot or are unwilling to travel. The overall number of meetings for each activity seem to be lower, in-person meetings being used earlier in studies to develop group coherence, for example, but we've started to see trends towards an increasing number of in-person meetings over the last year. While the virtual environment has been a challenging one, it has also enabled the academies to reach an unprecedented number of uh, breadth of audiences and more successfully to engage the public with our work. We've had a large number of successful virtual and hybrid events, including in-person events, uh, three academy annual meetings, which, which included two of those, including indoctrination of three years of members. Um, so thousands of people uh, were brought together to our facilities over the course of this year. And this has allowed us to draw upon and glean useful information about um, lessons learned, platforms, and technologies. So we're Still recovering <laughs> from the pandemic, I would say, our current on-site office space is dominated by individual offices and workstations. And moving forward, we believe that staff desire building spaces that are more flexible and adaptable to suit um, their informal meetings and collaborative work when they're in the building. And we're starting to see as more staff and visitors enter the building, more of the in-person time being spent on networking, innovation, idea sharing, and impromptu uh, collaboration. And the on-site workspace may need to transform um, according to that work. We're going to continue to experiment with hoteling, modular office spaces, and other flexible office arrangements, and uh, continue to use the virtual meeting technologies, which increased from 30 a day from pre-pandemic to over 400 a day in September, and that number just keeps rising. Um, while you know, while we're seeing this this uh, number of virtual and hybrid meetings grow, we're watching that very carefully and monitoring to make adjustments all along the way. We're striving to create this new normal as we emerge from the pandemic, um, and we have a new perspective. It's provided us the opportunity to rethink how we do things and to consider how our work impacts the environment as well. We desire to reduce our carbon footprint, and at the same time, more staff are commuting and our volunteers are traveling to us more often. How we balance that going forward was going to take work and innovative thought. And NASM is a traditional organization, and vectoring back to in-person for the act those activities that are ripe for innovation, free-form discussion, ideation, social interaction, etc., is really important to us. Although, um, as we do move into these areas, we're looking for ways to broaden our opportunities for engagement. So I just want to point out a few, wind up by a few talking points about some of the lessons learned. Now, I think you probably have felt this as well, but fully in or fully remote is easier than hybrid. Hybrid meetings require one to be extremely thoughtful, attentive, and present. Technology has improved vastly, but there are still challenges. You know, face-to-face -face meetings and face-to-face -face interactions build social capital, and they fill a voice, a void uh, in human interaction. It's very different in person, and, and we need to have that social capital because that uh, allows us to excel at what we do. So our rapid and effective adjustment to the pandemic demonstrated the workplace model that includes a significant video component, and that's, that is the way we're going to be moving forward. Um, the fully remote and hybrid environments open up opportunities to broaden our reach, invite volunteers from a more diverse background, and provide unprecedented flexibility to our staff. And, the, and with the impact of the environment front of mind, we actually need to move very carefully and, and, and give thought to what is the right answer. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. And I hope you are enjoying the uh, presentations. And I look forward to our open um, Q&A.
coming up after the next speakers. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, Lori. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard Gallagher, President and Editor-in-Chief at Annual Reviews, who will tell us about virtual and hybrid editorial committee meetings for Annual Reviews journals. Thank you, Shannon, and hello, everyone. Um, I want to say I really appreciate um, the Keystone organization uh, putting this meeting together. It's great to share the issues with um, people who are in similar situation, and I'm hoping that we'll all learn a lot from this. I'm going to talk about the particular set of meetings that Annual Reviews organizes, and I thought I would start with a little bit of background about our organization. We are a small, non-profit um, publishing company based in uh, just outside San Francisco. It was founded in 1931 uh, by a group of scientists, biochemists actually, who felt that there was information overload in biochemistry and they needed an annual review of everything that had gone on. Uh, so it was founded by scientists, for scientists, and has continued um, to, to follow that model, uh, adding more and more journals over the years. We only publish review journals, 51 of them in total. Um, for what it's worth, 35 of them are ranked in the top three in their field. So we share a lot of the same uh, volunteers that the, that uh, Laurie talked about uh, for the National Academy. Our authors and our editorial um, board members are uh, from a similar group, um, although we uh, solicit globally and, and not only from within the United States. The content of our journals are 100% invited. You don't submit a paper for consideration. <clears throat> so the editorial committees and the editorial committee meeting is absolutely the um, center of, of everything that we do. Our editorial committees uh, comprise of 10 to 15 people and uh, they serve five-year terms typically. So there's a cycling through of new members uh, constantly. Annual Reviews is working on becoming an open access publisher in 2023. Uh, we've developed this new model called Subscribe to Open, and it looks like it's uh, going to implement OK, and, and all 51 of our titles, we hope, will be open access from uh, next year onwards. We also publish a general science magazine that I won't talk about uh, any more today called Knowable. So I'll go through the pre-pandemic arrangements. So this covers the, I guess, the first 90 some years of annual reviews existence. Uh, we each journal has um, every year a one day, so actually sometimes more than one day, but typically a one day in-person editorial committee meeting, which selects the journal content for the upcoming issue. Historically, these meetings have been held in uh, the United States, uh, sometimes in other um, uh, places in, in North America, but mostly in the United States. But increasingly, as we've um, diversified the geography of the committee members, the meetings are held in other parts of the world. Uh, that's typically in Europe, but sometimes also in Asia and um, sometimes in Latin America. In the pre-pandemic era, we occasionally had um, remote participants. I guess it was somewhat frowned upon. It was audio only, and it was just in circumstances that people couldn't make it to the meeting. They, they, they would dial in, at least for a period of the meeting. Uh, our committee saw the in-person meetings as essential to their task uh, for high quality interaction and, and uh, discussion about, about their subjects. Also, the meetings were considered to be a major perk, and still are considered to be a major perk of of being on the editorial committee. Uh, it's often described as um, you know, the most useful meeting that they have in the whole year because they're sitting with only a dozen or so um, experts in their field and they're teasing out these uh, uh, very interesting uh, issues, um, discussing all these topics and, and who might cover them. Um, they're also, as has been mentioned, important social events. People get to um, uh, gossip, catch up, and so forth. Um, I don't know that anyone's met a spouse at any of our meetings, but I guess that's a possibility as well. 
Uh, on the negative side, the costs of these meetings were continuing to rise in the pre-pandemic era. And of course, we were aware that this was the major source of greenhouse gas emissions for our organization. Um, we started to um, collect data on our carbon footprint in um, 2019 and, and uh, buy uh, carbon offsets to, um, to, to cover that. But nonetheless, uh, this is a, a major source and a problem for, for the organization. We did a few problems with meeting timing because everybody went to the same location. And other than those who had a bit of jet lag, um, it, it all worked perfectly. Uh, during the pandemic, of course, all of the staff were remote. All of the editorial committee meetings suddenly had to be completely virtual. And after some trials with different platforms, we settled on Zoom, principally because it was the one that most people were familiar with. And so it didn't involve any training. They were comfortable to join. Initially, we uh, really replicated the in-person format, which was quite unsatisfactory. You know, to sit as as we've already heard, to sit for a whole day uh, on a Zoom meeting, uh, only speaking rather occasionally, um, was was not really good. It was far too long. People were really insufficiently engaged. Um, also, as as we have committee members around the world, and the meetings were organised usually around times that were most convenient for East Coast US, which is where most of the committee members still tend to be based. It made it very difficult, um, for, especially for Asian and Australasian participants who were sometimes joining the meeting at 2 or 3 a.m., sometimes working through the night. And despite that fact, we've increased geographic um, participation through the pandemic period in part because it didn't cost us any money to have guests from different parts of the world. So long as they were prepared to dial in at awkward times, we were delighted to have them. Uh, moving to a remote um, format did put new committee members at a disadvantage. They, didn't, they weren't able to see how things worked. They, it wasn't obvious to them how, how to uh, interject and so on. But we've gradually adapted to the medium. The meetings have become shorter. Uh, we've introduced um, uh, changes to how the meetings are run to make them more equitable so that everybody gets a chance to speak um, regularly during the course of the meetings and so forth. And these uh, virtual meetings, I would say, have been effective. We haven't had to delay publication of any journals. But I think there's been less enjoyment, less sparkle uh, to the events uh, as, as they've been virtual. It's um, saved us money for sure, and there have been environmental benefits of not flying people around the world. The current arrangements, I'm not trying to suggest that we're not still in the pandemic, but I want to um, look at this current era of uh, where we've moved to more hybrid, a hybrid kind of approach. At the moment, most of our meetings are hybrid, and there's a minority that are still fully remote that depends on the editor's preferences. Um, now we have rules that in person, even for hybrid meetings, uh, we have new committee members joining that will only participate um, virtually fr fr from now on. And uh, the committees have, of course, been happy to accept that. But most of our committee members prefer in-person meetings. And I think it, it affirms the importance of the fuller engagement that you get when you, when you spend the day and in, in the evening uh, with, with the people on the committee. Uh, some of those uh, new committee members especially have uh, committed to remote um, participation, whether it's for family reasons, uh, for um, uh, reasons to do with climate change, for um, impositions from their, from their institutions. Uh, we're, we're happy to have them join remotely. And we've introduced, and I want to give a call out to my colleague Jen Jongsma, who's also on this meeting, who has done a lot of the innovation here. We've in introduced uh, strategies to make sure that all participants, whether they're in person or remote, or remote, are on an equal footing. And I can talk a little bit more about that perhaps during the discussion. We do tend to have uh, frequent late withdrawals from in-person participation, uh, whether someone's just had a positive COVID test or for various other reasons. Um, there's a lot more churn in the arrangements than there, there were before. And uh, these timing issues um, 
are definitely exacerbated by participation across time zones, um, even in Europe, but especially participation from people in Asia and, and Australia. In general, as was mentioned earlier, the meeting costs uh, where we are in person seem to be much higher than they were pre-pandemic. Flights are more expensive, hotels are more expensive, and so on. The outlook, and uh, uh, this is the final slide, um, I think, is I, I don't think that I see a consensus on what the best way forward for us is. That's why I'm so excited about this meeting, because I'm really interested in hearing about other experiences. We are um, exploring going to a situation where we do alternating meetings. One year we do completely remote and then the next meeting we do hybrid so that we still get the benefits of the in-person um, uh, exchanges, but that we have some of the, of, of the cost savings and, and uh, carbon uh, uh, output savings of, of, of being remote. We're also doing more pre-planning so that the meeting is much more efficient when it does take place. We don't start off at 7 a.m. and intend to finish around 5 p.m. We try to do a lot more of the work ahead of time, and there's definitely good ways to do that. One of the things I've noticed is that I've certainly interacted a lot more with the editors since, uh, since the start of the pandemic. Um, it's quite ironic, really. I didn't have much contact with the editors maybe once or twice a year, um, and I'd see them at the meetings. But now um, I tend to have, uh, Jen and I tend to have meetings every quarter or so with our editorial teams. And I think that's a huge benefit. And other members of the staff are all also interacting more with the volunteers. Um, uh, we've been working on uh, workflow changes and DEI initiatives. So we've actually been changing the way that we publish and we've been changing the nature of um, of the output uh, we've we've had uh, in parallel with the changes to the meetings we've had a very strong DEI initiative which has resulted in us becoming a lot more diverse at the committee level and at the people we invite level. Um, I'm hoping that uh, the the way forward will see will be at least budget neutral for us. Um, there are huge concerns around increasing costs and hopefully we'll make savings. Um, if, uh, but certainly be budget neutral. And whatever we do, we want to see re reduced greenhouse gas emissions over the all in-person approach. In fact, um, if our meetings went to all in-person again, our greenhouse gas emissions would go up because we're flying more people from uh, more distant parts of the world to participate. So that's a, a, a consideration that we're also very interested in, um, in taking into account. So that's where things are with us, and I'm looking forward to hearing um, how other organisations are are addressing the issues and and to hearing some uh, some smart solutions that we can apply. Thanks very much. Great, thank you so much, Richard. Our third speaker is Ms. Jennifer Pesinelli, Executive Officer at the Biophysical Society, who will tell us about balancing culture and accessibility the impact of virtual meetings at the Biophysical Society. Uh, thank you very much, Shannon. I'm happy to be here today to share with you what the Biophysical Society has been doing, um, but also, as Richard said, to learn from you all um, and to have some great discussions. So I want to share a little bit about uh, what the Biophysical Society is and what we've been doing with respect to meetings. Um, and cannot help but to give a shout out to my director of meetings, uh, Dorothy Chaconis, because she and her team have been leading our charges on this. So the Biophysical Society is uh, an organization, an individual member society that operates at the interface of biological uh, life sciences and physical sciences. We just underwent a strategic planning process this year to update our strategic plan. And I'm sharing with you our goals here because our goals um, from the strategic plan as well as our prior plan really drive what we do and how we operate. Um, so fostering a diverse and inclusive global community is our number one priority, um, as is investing in the future of biophysics, sharing knowledge about biophysics and advocating for biophysics. 
So how we meet, where we meet, um, and what we do is, is very important in, in terms of uh, achieving all of these goals and making sure that everything that we do is accessible to our members um, as best as possible. But there's a lot of complications with a meeting like ours. A little bit more about the society. We have about 7,500 members, primarily in academia, some in industry, but others uh, in government agencies. A third of our members are outside of the United States. So this is very important in considering uh, how we meet and when we meet. 35% uh, of our governing body, our council, is also are also international members, which is great because it's it makes it easier for them to be very mindful of our members um, and how we present ourselves and, and what we do. We have a large annual meeting, which I will talk about in more detail. We also have uh, several small meetings throughout the year. We also have a large journal program, uh, large meaning importance to our organization. We publish three journals. We have an eBooks program, we have 18 subgroups, uh, which are a key part of our meeting. Our subgroups are like special interest groups for some other organizations. We have 47 student chapters, uh, we do a lot in terms of education and career resources and have a fairly decent advocacy program for biophysicists as well. Uh, we have 17 staff. Uh, we're small um, and very busy. Uh, in terms of our meetings, um, so I'm going to focus mostly on our annual meeting today, but also did want to mention our thematic meetings of BPS conferences in a little bit more detail because they are part of how we serve our international community. Um, also, we had a few virtual symposia and networking events, which is not the best name for them, but I'll explain a little bit more about them and how they have really helped us reach out to our membership. But concentrating on the annual meeting, so this is the profile of our meeting pre-pandemic. Um, it's a five-day meeting. We have governance meetings on either end of it. Uh, we have um, uh, workshops. We have also um, uh, other events leading up to the meeting, so it ends up being more than five days for most of us. Um, but it rotates uh, West Coast and East Coast. We have a lot of members in Asia, so our West Coast meetings are very have been historically very accessible to them um, and very popular, which is why we've been doing a rotation with two on the West Coast and one on the East Coast. We've averaged uh, about 3,500 attendees over the years. With uh, I'm sorry. 5,300 attendees with 3,500 abstracts um, over the years. Uh, we have 112 average ins invited speakers to our symposia, plus 100 subgroup speakers. Um, we kick off our annual meeting with a subgroup Saturday, we call it, where all 18 of our subgroup uh, each host a four-hour symposia. So we have half of those in the morning and half of those in the afternoon, and those are very a big draw for our annual meeting because that's where all of our members get to really dive into their specific areas of uh, research and content. Um, we have 24 symposia and 64 platforms usually, and we're running nine concurrent sessions. We have over 50 uh, organized sessions from committees, meetings, or other events that occur during our annual meeting, um, and we've been averaging 130 exhibiting companies. So it's a very large meeting, and we were fortunate enough to meet in um, Sandy, Ego in February 2020, just prior to the world shutting down. So unlike some other organizations, we were really lucky that year that we were able to meet in person. Um, and these are photos from that year. We have a very connected community. There's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot of networking. I'm sure with uh, those of you who have similar types of conferences, you know that very well. There's great conversations going on throughout the meeting in the hallways. Uh, in the exhibit halls, in the rooms, in before meetings, after meetings, et cetera. So being together and being in person has always been a big part of our meeting culture. Um, in 2020, as I mentioned, we were lucky enough to meet in person. It was February and our keynote speaker is actually from China. He was the winner of our BPS annual lecture award, which is our largest society award. He was not able to travel as uh, shutdowns for our were Tra travel from China had already begun occurring. So we actually Skyped him in, um, and that was the first time that we had ever had a remote speaker uh, at that level of a session in any one of our meetings. And little did we know that that was sort of the beginning of um, what our entire meeting was going to look like the next year. In 2021, 
Um, along with everyone else, we had an entirely virtual meeting. We kept a five-day um, event, but we had a different format. We only had five symposia, where we had many more in prior years. Um, we did focus on our subgroup symposia and Sorry, we had four live symposia, which were sort of main event, main speaker sessions. Uh, we did keep all of our subgroup symposia on the first day and our platform sessions. And part of that was to prioritize the individual topic areas as well as our younger members who tend to speak more often in the platform sessions. So we had concurrent sessions. Uh, we had online poster gallery with live text chat. The vendor that we used for that did not have um, video capabilities at that time, but got that shortly after our meeting, uh, which was in February 2021. And we did leave the content available for eight weeks following the meeting. So we had fewer attendees, unlike some other organizations who saw a big spike in their attendance when they were virtual. Um, we had a drop in attendance um, and far fewer abstracts and exhibiting companies as well. I was asked to share vendors that we worked with. So this is just a quick snapshot of who we worked with for that meeting. Um, Cadmium CD was our main meeting platform, and they did our e-poster gallery and our virtual exhibit hall. Um, they were modifying their platforms and technology along with a lot of other vendors before, during, and after our meeting. So I think we had a lot of good features and, and more came after we, we met with them. We did use Remo, uh, as we we're using for this particular conference, to do some of our networking events. We, we went ahead and had our um, poster competitions for our students and our undergraduates. We also had several general networking sessions um, and meet the editor sessions and Remo worked very well for us. So short of being able to meet in person and do those things like we usually did, it was, it was a good solution. And I think our attendees engaged quite well in that. And we relied heavily on our uh, audio visual vendor who was uh, formerly named BAV, but is now part of Inspire. And they did pre-recording of our um, uh, anchor and platform speakers and our subgroup speakers. We did have live Q&A, um, but all those talks were recorded. They produced our live sessions and then they streamed and recorded our um, live Q&A sessions as well. So in terms of feedback for our virtual meeting, of course, there was a mix, but these were a couple of the themes that rose to the top is, is people did like the ability to attend the meeting while working from home. Uh, there was a flip side to that, that people said they were distracted, not as able to concentrate as fully on the meeting as when they're there in person. But they did like to be able to switch easily between sessions. Um, some people preferred to ask questions via chat rather than in person. So, so that was nice for them as well. Um, but we did get a lot of feedback that people really missed the in-person interaction engagement that they usually have at our meeting. Um, and I think you know, we, all, we all felt that, but we're, we're pretty pleased with the way that the meeting went overall. In 2022, though, we were able to meet again in person and we met in San Francisco this past February, but we did not want to move entirely to in-person. Um, because we still had members that were unable to travel either due to the pandemic, travel restrictions, inability to get visa, or just the expense of things. So we did have an on-demand option as well where we recorded um, certain sessions and we had our poster gallery online again as well. Uh, our attendee, our attendance numbers and our abstract numbers were not as strong as they were in 2020, but they were better than uh, they were for the virtual meetings. We did have a number of COVID protocols in place, of course, like vaccination verification. San Francisco was requiring the booster leading up to our meeting, and that was really a barrier for a number of our attendees, um, especially international attendees, to get the booster. So that had a big impact on some people's ability to attend. Um, we did cancel a major social event to help keep it safe. And while people missed that, I think they were, uh, they understood that for sure. So we were back in person, but with a little bit of a mix in terms of having an on-demand element as well. Registration, however, for that on-demand event was not very strong. Um, and the components that people could use prior and during the meeting, such as the online poster gallery, um, were used a lot then, but not used as much after the fact. And we actually only got about 80% of the um, poster presenters loading their posters up in the poster gallery. Somebody had made a comment before that scientists sometimes don't wanna share 
uh, in a hybrid event, in a hybrid environment, and that was certainly the case with some of our attendees. They did not feel comfortable posting posting the information. So we felt too that the people who attended or participated in the on-demand only were definitely missing some of the content from those who were there in person. Um, but in terms of financial impacts, prior to the pandemic, the annual meeting was a very nice revenue generator for our organization, and, and we depended on it quite a bit. Um, we lost money in 2021 with the virtual only. Again, attendance was down, exhibits were a fraction of what we had before, and, and costs were different, right? We didn't have all the expense of the in-person meeting and the travel, um, but we were still paying for new platforms and technology. Then with 2022, moving back to that in-person, but having on-demand, um, between on-demand and um, COVID precautions, we had quite a few more expenses that we normally do. Uh, so again, we had a net loss this year with our annual meeting. And for 2023, we are doing in-person only. We are not repeating on-demand for this meeting. We do not feel that it was successful enough um, to warrant the costs. Um, and we're budgeting to break even. We are concerned about some accessibility issues because there are still those who are concerned about travel for a, a number of reasons. Um, visas also remain a challenge for some of our members and we know that will impact them as well. But we look forward to um, seeing how we recover with the 2023 meeting and then what we can do uh, moving forward to make our events more accessible. The, as I mentioned, we met in 2020 in San Diego, and then when we met again in 2022, a lot of our members said that our meeting was the last thing they attended before the pandemic and the first thing they attended after the pandemic, which was, which was kind of nice um, to be back together. But, you know, to follow on to uh, some of the comments that Richard made, you know, even though our annual meeting itself has moved back to primarily in person, we have moved a number of our governance events to uh, to virtual, including one of our annual council meetings, a number of our committee meetings, an advisory board meeting. So we never had any of those things virtually prior to the pandemic, but we did learn that those types of meetings, we could be very successful and effective. Um, so that gave us an opportunity to save money um, as well as do the business that we needed to do. We have also um, continued to do our small meetings in person. We rescheduled all the 2020 and 2021 events because of the pandemic. There's always been discussions about should these small conferences be um, hybrid? Should they be virtual? But the intent of the thematic meetings in the BPS conferences was to help serve uh, international members or members in locations who weren't necessarily accessible to our annual meeting. Uh, so they're small meetings, they're member organized, and they have typically about 100 to 120 people attend each of them. And there's been just an overwhelming sense from organizers, attendees, and even our leadership that these need to remain in person. That said, we have had some virtual symposia. Our first one was addressing COVID-19 challenges. Another was to celebrate the Protein Data Bank anniversary. Um, we also have what we call networking events, and again, probably need to be rebranded because prior to the pandemic, these were member organized um, sessions, symposia, half day workshops, et cetera, in Africa, South America, Europe, just all over. And we do about 12 of those a year, and we give the organizers the chance, the opportunity now to decide whether they want to do it in person or virtually. Um, and those are very popular and very well attended and make our content accessible to members in, in remote places throughout the world. So I'm wrapping up here, but uh, look forward to the discussion with the panel and look forward to hearing any questions that you all might have. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Jennifer. And our final speaker in this group is Mr. Derek Orr of the National Institute of Standards and Technology. He is Division Chief of Public Safety Communications at the Communications Technology Laboratory. Today, he will tell us about the integration of virtual content in the Public Safety Communications Research Annual Stakeholder Meeting. 
Great. Thank you so much, Shannon. I appreciate it. Uh, it is great to be here. Um, it's very eye-opening going last, recognizing uh, that we really aren't that different than anybody else that has uh, talked before. Uh, we didn't know that uh, as a program. We felt like everything that was happening to us was unique and our challenges were unique, but <clears throat> ends up that we sound very similar to everybody else. So uh, just a little bit of background. Uh, my name is Derek Orr. I'm the Division Chief of the Public Safety Communications Research Division at NIST, the National Institute of Standards Technology. Uh, we are under the Department of Commerce in the U.S. government and serve as the United States um, Measurement uh, Laboratory. So keeps the nation's time, keeps weights and measures. And my division specifically is focused on supporting uh, the United States public safety community, fire, police, and EMS, uh, and helping them improve their communications capabilities, uh, especially uh, after 9-11 when there was a significant uh, recognition of the shortfalls of our public safety's ability to communicate in disaster. Uh, our organization really took off at that point and uh, became a focal point for research and development to help public safety take full advantage of communications capabilities in order to be able to respond more effectively and more safely uh, to both day-to-day -day events and uh, large-scale events. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna talk about, and it's gonna sound very sim similar, so I, I, I'll, I'll be careful and not wade too deeply into things that have already been talked about, but, um, I'll talk about what our, our past has been uh, very, very quickly. We, we typically gather our stakeholder community, which is made up of public safety. Uh, so as I said, fire, police, EMS, uh, around the United States and around the world for that matter. Uh, we also bring in industry, academia, and other government uh, federal organizations to come together and to discuss everybody's contributions and, uh, and capabilities in addressing public safety's needs for advanced communications. We've done uh, a in-person annual meeting for 12 years now, and it has been a cornerstone of our year. We've really used it to hold ourselves accountable to our stakeholders. We've used it to, to, to read out on all of our projects and programs, uh, to provide hands-on demonstrations of the technology that's being developed in-house or through our grantees or prize, prize uh, challenge participants. Um, so it has been an important element of our program to really show the community uh, what we're working on and bring them together so that they can uh, find better ways to collaborate and make new connections. So, as we've heard on in, in every talk today, um, uh, we were used to this in-person event. We typically drew around 500 people a year uh, and, and had uh, a very hands-on experience, especially around technology demonstrations, sometimes as many as 70 technology demonstrations. And then these, this is not a, um, this is uh, this is not a vendor um, uh, exhibition. These were more like uh, science projects um, uh, being uh, displayed by researchers, uh, many of them uh, 10 to 15 years out and, and becoming commercialized. So, um, so as you can see in the top right corner of this slide, uh, many of them are on tables. It looks more like a science fair than it does a more typical, uh, I would say, um, uh, you know, CES type of event or something with booths uh, that, that didn't exist in, in these uh, areas. So COVID hit, obviously, like everybody else talked about, we were only, we typically hold our meeting in June of, uh, of the summer. And so COVID, uh, COVID shut us down in March. So by then we were already prepared to hold our June event. We had a location, we had an agenda, we had our speakers lined up. Uh, we did not typically do any online uh, content. So we were three months out from a, a date for a uh, stakeholder meeting and had to pivot quickly uh, to create a virtual event so we could maintain um, our effort of reading out and bringing our stakeholders together and ensuring that they're uh, participating and bought into the work that we're doing in our program. Uh, what we did, because we had so little time, uh, we didn't have a lot of time to figure out what it meant to do a virtual conference. So really what we did is try to recreate as much as possible uh, the actual conference. So we, from the ground up, created a scratch uh, PDF environment of uh, an interface 
where people could come and go to on-demand sessions that were recorded during that spring by all of our researchers that would have provided live sessions. Uh, we did hold a few live session panels. Uh, we also created mechanisms to do technology demos, whether they were pre-recorded or in a virtual environment, and that was all experimental on our part. Uh, we created a networking lounge to try to, to try to still foster the ability of people to get together and, and, uh, and communicate and meet. Uh, and then we had a section uh, focused on our open innovation prize challenge uh, programs. Uh, so that was our initial effort uh, at creating or at least maintaining our annual meeting uh, during COVID. Uh, so we did create a, 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 a significant amount of digital content in a short period of time, both in the online sessions and in the demonstrations and had to create a whole mechanism to help people uh, with help desks and tutorials and be able to, to navigate uh, during the time. Um, so the, the biggest change for us is because we're the US government, uh, we have to be cost neutral in running our conferences or else we have to pay out of pocket out of our program costs. And so we try to, uh, we try to raise enough fees through our conferences to cover the cost of the conference. Um, so traditionally, our conference had cost, it's still a very inexpensive conference compared to many, but typically our conference fees were somewhere in the uh, 350 to 450 range uh, for a two to three day conference. Um, so going fully digital in this experience changed one thing significantly, which was we were able to provide all of this for free. So our conference in, uh, in 2020 was totally free to participants. And that made a significant difference for us. We saw a more than doubling of our attendees from the typical 500 to over 1,000, um, which was, was, was fascinating. We saw that most of that uptick was in the private sector uh, who uh, joined and may not have typically come to our conference. Um, so that was a significant change for us to see that type of a jump in our, in our attendance from going from a, a fairly inexpensive paid in-person, although there is the expense of traveling and hotel costs, I understand that. But, um, uh, but w once we went free, um, we significantly increased the participation rate um, from, from people coming. So getting the feedback from people after the conference, uh, we found that um, one, I think the fact that COVID had hit and uh, people were recognizing that we would be home potentially for a long period of time uh, and a lot of events were being canceled. They were in a, I would say a, um, a willing, they were in a willing state of mind to play in this space and just happy that something was still going to happen instead of everything being canceled. So I feel like we got a pass in the first year in that people were just happy there was a meeting. So um, uh, our overall ratings were high. Uh, people appreciated the ability to get access to the on-demand on content, to see some of the demos. Um, but certainly, like others have already talked about today, uh, we just could not recreate not just the um, not just the networking capability. We couldn't recreate the energy around Q and As of, in, in individual sessions, uh, whether they were live or on demand. Uh, and so that was something that we were surprised about, especially the Q and A piece, because we did create mechanisms to do that. Uh, it just was very difficult to get that interaction. Um, so, in preparation tw uh, for 2021, when it became obvious that we were going to be uh, uh, virtual again, we actually began uh, working with a more traditional virtual uh, uh, web interface, uh, developing the entire program with the idea that it was going to be virtual, and we had a year to do so. So we did spend a lot of time on the interface and the content. Um, we did see a decrease in, it was still free in 2021. We saw a decrease in attendees. And really that's, I think that's about that because it was free, a lot of people who otherwise would never come came and found out that's not the place they expected to be. And it, they didn't really have a purpose for being there. And so they didn't come the next year. Uh, but we still saw a typical increase over our in-person meetings. Um, 
And we did see, again, uh, people were happy with the event, but still, even after trying to re-engineer how we did Q&As and um, tech demos and, uh, and networking, it still fell short of what everybody was hoping for, and that was feedback we continued to get. So uh, moving into 2022, we were one of the first NIST programs that was actually able to go live again. So we did plan for a live meeting in San Diego uh, and we held that in June of this year. Uh, and we tried to bring together the best of both worlds of everything we had learned from our event uh, our, our events prior to COVID and our virtual events during COVID. And what that meant for us is that um, we did continue to create on-demand sessions uh, that um, people could get access to if they weren't able to make it in person. Uh, but we also created a very, um, I would say, hybrid approach to in-person meetings. Now, this wasn't a hybrid meeting. You could not watch the meeting live virtually. You could, uh, you could access the on-demand content, but you could not participate virtually. You either were there or you could access the, uh, the, the digital content. Um, so uh, we created a mechanism, uh, mechanisms to enhance the ability for people to interact uh, while on site. So we created, we went away from the more traditional push of information to attendees and traditional PowerPoint settings and instead created things like campfire sessions where people sat around and it was a collaborative uh, facilitated session getting feedback and uh, and ideas from our attendees that help drive our program in the future. Um, we, we had 331 attendees, which is down from our normal number, but we were happy with that given the fact it was most people's first time out from uh, post-COVID. Uh, and we are planning for our June event this year, and we expect to probably be back to normal, if not above. Um, so uh, what we really focused around this meeting was creating a more uh, hospitable environment in the COVID world. So those campfire sessions, we, we uh, had the ability to hold a number of our sessions outdoors. So we did that and that made people feel much more comfortable. Uh, San Diego allows for that oftentimes. Uh, so again, we did see a decrease in attendance, but that was really one of the first outings after COVID. Um, so we weren't surprised. We did see people uh, much more excited. The energy was back from those uh, two years of, um, of uh, virtual sessions. And they truly appreciated having a, a less push, uh, um, traditional push inf uh, of information to attendees and, and, uh, and instead being able to fully participate in the discussion in, in live, um, uh, live facilitated uh, uh, sessions. So that's something we definitely want to continue leveraging. And we went back to hands-on technology, technology demonstrations, which made all the difference in the world, obviously. It means something to actually be able to put a headset on, see a heads-up display, uh, hear audio of, of communications, and understand the impact on the first responder versus seeing it virtually. Uh, or pictures of what we're working on. And you can see the results from feedback we got from our surveys, our post uh, surveys from the conferences. Uh, in the two on the left are our virtual ones, and people were talking about that it was good information, a good way of uh, you know creating um, the ability to digest information through on-demand sessions. But then you go over to our 2022 meeting and everybody was talking about networking, collaboration, innovation. Um, so you, we really saw the importance of that element to our attendees. Um, uh, we also created a virtual lab tour um, so that people could visit our site here in Boulder, uh, given the fact that COVID really shut down that capability. And so now people can walk through our 360 degrees degree space and come visit us anytime they want. And that's kind of this, this need to, um, to, to give access to people uh, in a virtual environment. Um, so looking forward, we are going to be focusing on networking, tech demos, Q and A's, uh, interactions, and uh, we probably won't do as many on-demand sessions, uh, but we will definitely be focusing on our live event experiences. Uh, and I hit my 15 minutes, so uh, I will just quickly say that we are certainly learned from the virtual environment and the need to create a hybrid environment uh, when you are mixing 
tools, especially in our day-to-day -day operations. So we, we, we do have live meetings, but we also all are facing our, our, our laptops so that we're talking to people um, uh, as, if, as if they were there and not relying on cameras at the end of the table uh, where people feel disassociated from the conversations. So it definitely changed our perspective. But we also understood and found that the, the, the power of a live meeting um, couldn't be replicated. At least we weren't able to replicate it um, in, a, in a virtual environment. So um, I appreciate the time. I look forward to the Q&A. And uh, I, I appreciate the perspectives of all the other panelists. So thank you. OK, great. Well, thank you all for those really interesting perspectives about how you all adapted to the changing environments during the pandemic and now as we attempt to do hybrids and things like that. Um, as a reminder to our audience, you can click on the Q&A tab and vote on other people's questions if you'd like to hear them answered, as well as that's where you can submit your questions for our panelists. Um, I'll start our discussion today by asking each of you overall, how do the benefits and challenges of putting on virtual and hybrid meetings pencil out for your organization. And we've already heard from some of you if you plan to continue in the future, but how do those considerations go into your plan for the future when it comes to this coming year and more long-term? Lori, do you wanna start us off there? Sure. Um, so I think that like everyone else, it's, it's really been, this has been great hearing from everyone else. And we are, we are in very, very similar situations. And I think, you know, we, we want to walk up to this slowly um, and, and see how things play out. But we are offering as much as we can. Um, we're going to continue offering hybrid <clears throat> opportunities and during um, our events. Um, some, some types of meetings like board meetings and, and that type, um, might be all in or all out. Uh, but I think for, for most of our, and, and member meetings, you know, they can be required to be in. So I think it's a mix for us. It's a mix. And we're, we're really open to getting the feedback and understanding how we want to evolve. Richard, any thoughts from you? Yeah, um, the costs of in-person meetings were going up anyway. They're going up even more now. E even not taking anything else into account, we have to find a different way moving forward. I think the answer for us is probably that we do um, fully remote meetings one out of two or two out of three years. But we still want to hang on to the idea of getting people together in person it's it's really important for it's really important for the culture of of our of our journals it's important for us to stay connected with people that are our volunteers so i suspect that if i was to say how things are going to develop unless there's some substantial breakthrough in in making virtual meetings give us that X factor that we get from the personal interactions and we'll, we'll be looking to alternate. Mm. I like to, in your talk, you call it the sparkle. <laughs> yeah, it's tough to, tough to get that sparkle in the hybrid and virtual environments. Um, Jennifer, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I think uh, one thing I didn't really get to address was the, uh, you know, the idea of doing hybrid with our annual meeting. It's just, it's so large. Uh, the expense is quite, you know, astronomical. Um, so that was why we decided last year to do the on-demand, right? We recorded not even all of it, but certain segments that we felt were important to offer those. Um, and then even just looking at it for 2023, just the costs of internet access and AV for the in-person alone, let alone to stream anything is just really um, unaffordable for us, um, mm -hmm. kind of outrageous will in some respects. So I really think that, you know, we'll have our in-person meetings, but develop a lot of those virtual, you know, online only events as well with doing the symposia, the virtual local networking events and things like that um, to make sure that we have content available for, for members who can't join us. 
uh, for one reason or another. And like, and again, like Richard is doing, moving some of our meetings to um, virtual only that makes sense. Uh, one out of the three council meetings, uh, certain committee meetings and board meetings, that gives us an opportunity to reduce costs and make sure it's they're very accessible. Mm -hmm. And Derek? Yeah, um, you know, an interesting element that, that surprised us, or I guess we hadn't thought about, is that although our meeting became free in the virtual environment because we weren't, we weren't getting space at a hotel and people weren't traveling and we weren't doing reimbursable travel for public safety, what we didn't think about is that it was not free for the program. Um, so I'm a division chief of a division of scientists and engineers, and the amount of time it required us to plan and then have all the scientists and engineers record and prep and then and then um, publish all that material, that's time they're not actually doing the research and the science. And we found that, um, one, their stress levels increased significantly. They felt... Um, even though we thought it'd be easier for them to pre-record and, and present, and so they weren't, we wouldn't have the pressure of presenting live. The, the there was a lot of pressure they, they felt in the recording sessions and getting it right because they could and they they had the time. Um, so uh, we have found and are working towards an environment where we're going to try to reduce as much as possible the the stress and load on the scientists, keep them in the lab as much as possible, and that's probably going to be focusing more on that. Um, that that engagement style of those fireside chats and other uh, other types of engagements where they're not having to do a lot of preparation ahead of time, but they're there to talk to the to our stakeholders and and share information live. Um, but that was that was an element we were pretty surprised about. Yeah, it, um, I think we found that here too at Keystone Symposia. It seems simple to put together a platform if you've never done it before because it just as an audience member it's all just appears there but um there's a lot that goes on in the back end when it comes to setup and troubleshooting yep. and coordinating and um and it's a learning process as well so it's not going to go that smoothly the first time around or maybe even the second time around but then as you kind of do it repeatedly it can become easier and less stressful but that's first the adaptations are a little challenging for the organization. Um, Jennifer, you made an interesting point about the cost for your very large meeting was exorbitant and just unattainable versus some of the smaller meetings. Can you talk a little bit more and maybe all the others can also contribute to comparison of costs when it comes to virtual or hybrid and how that relates to the size of the meeting and the format of the meeting? Right. Well, you know, certainly we found with our meeting, we are in convention centers, right? We're too large to be just in a hotel space. So we're paying for internet, AV, techs, uh, local labor, um, things like that. And those costs have, they've always been high, but they've gone up a lot um, since the pandemic. And so to be able to set up a room to do streaming or something like that at our annual meeting is just it's something we just simply can't afford. I mean, even select, we'll record our annual lecture this year, but we won't stream it, um, for example, because we go from you know a few thousand dollars to tens of thousands of dollars for one session. Um, whereas our smaller meetings, like our governance or our committee meetings, if we can have those at BPS headquarters or say our president's home institution, um, if we can do them at university facilities or offices, typically the costs are a lot lower and a lot more manageable. So that's that's easier easier for us to do. Interesting, yeah, so the facility charges is the issue there, not necessarily the platform itself cost. Right, right. Got it. Does anyone else have any insights about different sizes of meetings you've held or tried to hold? I would say, you know, there's always a cost, right? The cost is either in the facilities, getting the facilities set up or getting IT set up or both if you're in a hybrid. And if you're in a hybrid, you have almost the worst of all worlds. You have to pay for the IT and you have to pay for the facility. So um, trying to figure out what the right model is 
where you want to put your money, where you're going to get the most return for your volunteers or for the participants, where's that return going to come from? And I think many um, of our uh, of our speakers here spoke of what worked and what didn't work. And so figuring out where you want to put your money on those to get the most bang for that buck is, is going to be a really important exercise. And we will do the same thing. Some of, uh, of our larger meetings, which do cost a lot, um, they're, you can't do those any other way because they're, they're, you know, to recognize or award or, and that just doesn't come across the same over a Zoom call or something like that. It's hard to recognize and, and, and make that a very special event. So I think it's just going to take some um, trial and error to see what works for each of our organizations in each different scenario. Mm -hmm. And I will just add, I, to back up Jennifer's point, um, we've been very surprised by the amount of cost increase that has occurred just since COVID. Uh, to the point where we're going to have to consider what impact that has on our events in the future, uh, because there's a limit of we have to we have to cover all of our costs with fees, but we're really reaching out to a community of firefighters and police officers and EMS. We can't charge them a thousand dollars, right? So uh, there's an upper limit that we'll we're going to be able to go, um, and that's going to at some point that's going to force us into you know pivoting in some way to address that rising cost. So uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's gonna be a problem if it continues to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. Richard, did you raise your hand for something? Yeah, uh, I wanted to make a comment as a meeting attendee rather than as a meeting organizer. And uh, I, have to, I have to say that I really love the opportunity to participate um, online in meetings. I mean, this meeting is a good example. Um, if if you'd, you guys had sent out a call to um, come to Colorado for this meeting, I don't think that we would have got the size of crowd that we have here. There's some, there some huge advantages to participating in things that maybe are not your absolute core, but they're of interest. And so in a lot of ways, I think that um, the opportunity to participate relatively cheaply uh, in this case without any charge at all in in a meeting is make, makes you hugely uh, more broad in 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 how in who you are able to speak to and in the information that you can get and uh, we're very focused on the people that are our core um, attendees and things like that but there there are these other shit you know groups of attendees that are maybe not core that might be drawn into participating in part of all of the virtual meetings. And that's a huge plus, I think, of, of virtual meetings. Yeah, and Derek had mentioned they had a lot more people attend, at least the first fully virtual meeting. Um, Jennifer and Laura, did you guys see increased general attendance to virtual when you did hold that? Yeah, ours we did not, um, and maybe it could be because we were a, you know, a full year after the pandemic started when we had our first virtual meeting, and I do think we were hearing from some people that there was already some Zoom fatigue, right? Um, but our attendance at our entirely virtual meeting was uh, almost 2,000 lower than our in-person. So, um, and we had, you know, we, we still charged a registration fee, but it was greatly reduced compared to in person and of course people also didn't have travel expenses but it didn't didn't have the draw that some other organizations experienced mm -hmm. i would say ours was mixed um you know we we would have more people i think sh uh res register for events but it's a whole lot different to sit on zoom all day long in a conference rather than moving from room to room physically and seeing people in in the interim it's a very very different experience so i think they more people anticipated having the opportunity because it was free or it was lower cost yeah this is a great opportunity for me to attend but then capturing them and holding them throughout the entire event was also very 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 challenging that's true. We actually looked at some of the data of um, how many people logged in, but also for how long and for which sessions for both our on demand and live stream and virtual meetings. And it is interesting. They seem to one or two sessions. They're like really there for 
and then they maybe they intend to watch the rest later and then don't get around to it which is often my problem but <laughs> um yeah it's uh it's hard to gauge how engaged that audience is throughout the conference and and often in a conference in a physical conference people will go to a session because they want to hang around afterwards and talk to the speaker and you know make some connections and that uh is harder to do virtually mm -hmm. seems to be harder to do virtually um speaking of that i there's an audience question here and i also wanted to touch base with you all about uh, jennifer had mentioned the remo sessions um what kinds of platforms and strategies do you use to do uh, poster sessions or networking sessions, things that are diff more difficult to do virtually? Did you use any creative platforms and how did you kind of envision that? And did the rollout of that go smoothly or not? Maybe Jennifer, you can expand on um, what you mentioned in your talk. It's like and Derek, I'm seeing Derek shake his head. No, it didn't go smoothly. But yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, we worked with Cadmium for our online poster gallery. It was it was a nice platform. I think um, you know not having had experience, I, I had a hard time wrapping my head around a virtual poster hall, um, considering we have thousands of posters. Um, but it worked fairly well. And as I mentioned, you know they were continuing to evolve their technology, so there were. There are features that they have now that we would have loved to have had during our annual meeting, um, such as the ability to do sort of Zoom connects with poster presenters or you know video connects. Um, what actually happened was some of our members uh, just shared their own Zoom links, public Zoom links, um, which worked in some cases, in some cases didn't because they weren't secure, they weren't within the platform. So we actually um, experienced some harassment for one of our members because other people glommed onto that Zoom link and. Um, just created an unfortunate situation. Mm -hmm. But we used uh, Remo for the networking events. And that was, it was, it was neat and fun and new to our members. Um, it was something that they hadn't done before. I think most of the feedback from those people who engaged in those sessions was, was pretty high. They just kind of liked the concept. It was fun. Uh, it was fun and different and it worked very well. Yeah, Derek, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll, so, you know, we are a R&D shop. We do look 10 years in the future. One of our areas is virtual reality and um, augmented reality. So we like to try to leverage that kind of capability. So we did build in some uh, aspects of virtual reality and, uh, and augmented reality into our demonstrations in that first year to try to give people almost like second life kind of um, uh, uh, interface in which you would be in a room with other people and you had an avatar, you go see their demo, you could talk to them live. Um, yeah, people did not do that. So it was us standing around in our virtual uh, rooms uh, for, you know, for hours uh, floating in space. But uh, so it, it was really hard and otherwise the only other way to do it was just doing a dip you know a video of a demo which loses a lot of that um uh engagement that occurs during demonstrations uh so you know we tried but it, it was really hard to get people out of their comfort zone uh and and try something different and new um so yeah that was that was a lessons learned for us that did not reoccur in 2021 so mm -hmm. Laurie, did you have anything to add? No, I just, I thought that was really uh, interesting because, you know, it is, it is uh, challenging to get people to try new things. And uh, just something like that, I had thought about that myself of, you know, what if we did it this fun way, but clearly uh, you have a mindset around what you're willing to do in a work environment or and and that doesn't uh, often bleed over into sort of the gaming kind of mentality where you're doing more fun things. It's it's hard to make that transition. We had uh, you know, we, we kept our big our big meetings and conferences in in person and there were very specific things like we didn't do the you know poster sessions in the way that everyone's talking about. We just had, you know, certain 
certain pre-recorded or, or recorded uh, sessions that people could call into. And I just don't think, as, as mentioned here, that they're very popular. Uh, some people will do them, but often they like the idea of it, but the execution is um, lacking. So I, I did, I did appreciate that, Derek, it, that visual. Uh, I won't, I won't bother to try that one. <laughs> yeah, I think we saw an interesting adoption as well with the, are we did remo poster sessions as well and networking events. And it also depended on the group. Like we host different topics of meetings and it seemed like some communities were like super into it, really wanted to give it a try. And others were like crickets and just like not, not wanting to give it a go. It also took some adaptation on our part about not just getting the platform set up in the best way and most user-friendly way, but how to communicate to them how to use it and where the kind of gaps were in our communication to them um, as to, yeah, how to eliminate some of those hurdles and things like that. Um, we have another question about uh, vendors. I know a lot of organizations use vendors as a way to finance meetings in person. How does that work virtually and in hybrid formats? Jennifer, I see you nodding down there. Well, I was, yeah, I was just thinking as we were talking more about the technology, you know, that we did a virtual exhibit hall and uh, it was half the size of our in-person and that did not work very well. I mean, it, the, the platform was really cool and really neat, but our members, attendees, just did not go visit exhibitors. So the exhibitor experience was very disappointing. I mean, they had, they got to do all kinds of neat things to set up their virtual exhibits, but it didn't draw and it didn't hold. Um, so that was really disappointing. And the exhibit hall for us is a, a huge source of um, income for our annual meeting. So, you know, we, we again, they paid a fraction of what they would pay for the in-person experience and even that was disappointing to them um, so that certainly hurt and then you know with the return to in-person in 2022 we had some good return on exhibitors coming back in person still some challenged with pandemic travel restrictions and things like that but um but yeah i think it's the feedback from our from our community anyway, is in person is, is definitely valued in that in that area. Yeah, we had a very similar experience with uh, vendors, although we do a lot fewer than most um, when it comes to our meetings. Laura, did you, you guys know, do vendors? Our big our biggest uh, one of our biggest meetings is the uh, Transportation Research Board, their meeting. And we did a very big uh, we did the the first one was virtual right during COVID and then they did a in person and it was um we did have a lot of vendors that come in for that and it seemed like there were fewer than you know much fewer and they it takes a lot of effort to set that up and i think the challenge is you're usually getting the vendors who are going to present at and be there at the next one so you need to have them there to make sure that you have fully populated vendor spa spaces in the next one. And I think that we're gonna see sort of a residual effect over time of um, trying to catch up on these because we'll do that annual meeting every year. And, you know, we're every year we're trying to get them to commit and sign up to the next, you know, what spot do they want? And if uh, they're not seeing that result, it, it was really kind of disheartening to see how, there were people there from all around the world, but it was still disheartening to see so much space between, you know, people weren't weren't at the vendor spot. So I think we're going to see some residual lag in that, and uh, that's going to be challenging. Mm -hmm. Richard, anything from your point of view? With um, no, we have no experience with vendors. I wanted to say something about posters, though. Um, posters mm -hmm. were always um, a kind of very different way of conveying information at meetings even before um, the pandemic. I think there might be an opportunity there. What I never really liked poster sessions either to present them or to go through the hall because you felt this kind of pressure to say something smart to anyone that walked past. <laughs> uh, and similarly, you I'm felt curious. the obligation to engage with someone whose work you might just not have a clue about. Uh, virtually, you could be much more selective about who you go to. And if the posters were available in advance, and I think this about um, presentations as well, I think that 
one real benefit of 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 a virtual meeting could be that you've already you've already listened to the person's talk or looked at their poster and the session is more of a discussion it could be like uh, the type of um, campfire thing that somebody talked about i think it might have been derek um where we're having a discussion about a piece of work rather than you're hearing about it for the first time and all your energy is is taken up with just understanding what's going on you've been able to think about it digest it and learn something about it and i do think that this idea of broadening out what you listen to so long as we can find ways of marketing our stuff to different audiences someone from the someone from the national academies might be who's not a biophysicist might be really interested in some of the things that are going on in biophysics maybe these virtual meetings should include a very general session that would be a call out to all scientists or maybe a call out to other groups in society i think there's lots of opportunities to think about how to convey scientific information even beyond the beyond the immediate community here mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, we're nearing the end of our time here, so I'm going to conclude by asking each of you to give us maybe some wrap up thoughts. And what is the biggest challenge for your organization moving forward in deciding on virtual hybrid formats and how to implement and accomplish that in a cost sustainable way? Richard, do you want to take us uh, off? Well, to be frank, the big, the biggest challenge is, um, is we think that we we can see what we need to do, but bringing the um, I don't know if I'm on mute. No, nope, I can hear you. Oh, bringing the um, bringing the editors along with us is the problem. They're more conservative than we are, so I think that you know that that's the real challenge is even now getting people to realize that there are good reasons for us to change and um, finding new things that we could do that that really um, that they buy into is 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 the biggest challenge that's a good point yeah Lori um I think that's probably two-pronged along the lines of what Richard said uh, you know there's a lot of culture and process and policy and everything around what we do and getting that to evolve is a real challenge it's going to be a really a uh, challenge going forward not only for you know everyone who's used to doing things a certain way and getting certain results and then looking at how much things cost and uh, how technically challenging it is to the individuals who we say, well, we want to have it in person, and they say, no, we're not interested in doing that. So it is going to take some balance and nuance and, and sensitivity to meeting everyone's needs and, and yet still pushing um, pushing things along in a way that you can evolve and be more be cost effective and efficient. So these are the challenges. It's it's a it's a systemic issue that we're all facing. And my my guide, my only um, recommendation or, or thought to leave everyone with is we're all in this together. <laughs> so you know we have to find ways. Now that we we've actually talked about how similar things are our our situations to find um, broader approaches that will help us all move forward to a to a new way of doing business. Thank it you. is interesting. It forced us all to be creative and be accepting of new ways of doing things and to adopt those. And now as we kind of exit the need for that, um, you can definitely feel people kind of recoiling from the, uh, the change and adaptation necessary back to old ways. And it would be great if we can continue to push those boundaries to some extent. Um, Jennifer, did you have some wrap up thoughts? Yeah, I think, yeah, we just have, we, we have communities that need uh, accessible options. Um, but for us, I think cost is the biggest challenge, just given the size of our event currently, which is, you know, why the littler events are easier to focus for those, but it's, it's not equitable, right? So we need to try and figure out how to resolve that. 
Yeah, and Derek. Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the things is we're gonna people are gonna need to continue to be innovative and uh, take risks uh, as we move towards this post COVID era, uh, hopefully. And um, uh, however, I think we have to be open to being honest about what works and what doesn't work and constantly reassessing and changing and adapting. Uh, you know, to Richard's point, um, we did do the, um, the, the fireside chats. We, we provided an on-demand session for every one of those, hoping that and made them available two weeks in advance. Very few people took advantage of it, but it didn't stop them from coming and fully participating in the fireside chat. So it's things like that, that we have to kind of step back, analyze, okay, that was a lot of time we spent on that material. So if we didn't get the hits we thought, then what should we do in the future to maximize um, uh, you know, that time in the sessions? So I think it's just gonna be, I think in the past we all operated off of things we've been doing for decades. And now we're learning year after year and uh, it's a good thing, but it's something we're gonna have to be open to. That's true. It leads to a lot more benefits as we've seen with kind of diverse audiences and reach, um, but it makes for a little bit more work on our end. Great. Um, well, we now have a 25 minute break. Um, first, I'm going to go through some of the poll results that we uh, took during this session. So Mitch, if you could put up poll number one. So we see that um, for those organizing scientific conferences, in-person attendance this past year compared to pre-pandemic levels, um, kind of distributed evenly, whether they saw reduced, greater, or equivalent attendance. And our next question. In the past year, what percentage of conferences did you attend in person versus virtually? We see a lot more um, in person. 25% attended in person and um, some only virtual. So. Uh, thank you all for participating in the polls. We'll have a few more for you at the second half of the session. And thank you to all of our panelists. This has been a great uh, start to considering the challenges and benefits and um, how to kind of figure out what the next steps forward in the post-pandemic era are. So we'll see everyone back here in 25 minutes.